and I actually have someone here who can tell us what she said. What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in Sociology and Psychology, my certifications in Criminal Interrogation and Body Language Analysis, and over 10 years as an award-winning mentalist to teach behavior analysis and body language analysis on stages and television shows all around the world. This week's video is going to be a follow-up or a part two to last week's video. So last week we looked at the Royals outside Windsor Castle as they were mingling with the crowd and accepting flowers for the recent passing of the Queen. And there was an interesting moment we looked at where Meghan Markle refused to give a bouquet of flowers to the aides who were there and whose job it was to collect those flowers and put them all in one place. And there were quite a few theories as to why she would do this that I talked about in the video and in the comments you guys had some incredible thoughts as well and I want to follow up on that moment. I also think this is a really great opportunity to show you all the thought process of an analyst and how it works because often we have the clues and we'll tell you here's what we're seeing and we'll give you a conclusion. But very often, even with some of the best analysts on YouTube, that middle part is missing where, where we walk you through that process and say, okay, here's what, like it could be this, but here's why it's more likely to be that. So I'm actually gonna walk you through the process today. So we're going to look at this in three parts. We're gonna look at all the theories that were listed, whether they were mine or the main ones that you guys talked about in the comments. Then we're gonna look at the body language, which we actually never did last week. So I'm gonna tell you what are we seeing in her face? What are we seeing in her mannerisms and what does it suggest? Finally, I actually have an expert who can tell us the exact words that she was saying to the aide. Because there are a lot of theories online. There's clips who have augmented the audio, but then I saw people accusing them of doctoring it and changing it, so it's not quite what she was saying. And then there's all kinds of different clips of people posting it and interpreting different things in what she's saying. Because even in the best cases, the audio is not very clear. But I actually have an expert here who can tell us what she said. Now before we jump into that moment, which will be the main focus of this video, there's another moment from the analysis that I want to talk about, which there's a question that a lot of you asked. It came up quite a bit and I want to talk about that because it's a really, really great question. The moment I'm talking about is when we saw Harry move from Megan's right to her left while they were looking at the flowers and we saw this really slow breakaway where instead of quickly breaking away, he was holding her, his left hand was holding her right hand and he transferred his left hand to his right hand on her arm, then he moved it from her arm to her back, then to the other arm and he split. And even as he was splitting, his arm was really extended. And I talked about how that was a very dragged out and slow way to separate and it indicates an exchange of comfort. Either she's comforting him or he's comforting her. So a question that came up a lot in the comments and I think it's a great question is, is it possible that he is holding on to her like this because he knows the protocol, which is they're not supposed to move ahead of William and Catherine. So he's subtly doing this to hold her back. And it's a good theory, but the reason I never presented it is because what we're seeing in terms of body language is not really consistent with restraint. First of all, if we look at his hand, he's never really holding on to her. He's never gripping her. It's a very delicate caress as he's moving to her left. Second, look at his focus, his eyes. They're looking down at the flowers. And yes, we see him pointing to something. So we can argue that he's saying, hey, hey, look over here to slow her down. I think it's a really good theory. But the bottom line is he doesn't seem to be focused on, oh, is she moving too fast? He's looking at the flowers. That's where his focus is. Finally, and most importantly for me, is the fact that he moved out of her way. And we very, very rarely move out of someone's way if we don't want them going in that direction. So if he really didn't want her to go ahead, he was exactly where he should be, in her way. He would have stopped there, he would have maybe held her hand, he would have looked down. That is a really effective way to stop her from going there. But if in his mind he's thinking, I don't want her going this way, it's very unlikely that he would move out of her way. So at the end of the day, is it possible that this touch is him trying to guide her this way, hold her back? It's possible. But given what we're seeing with the rest of his behaviors, it's highly unlikely that that's what he was thinking. To me, it's much more likely that it was just a soft, delicate touch, slowly separating because she provides him with comfort. He's also comforting her. And that's the reason that we're seeing this physical proximity take time to split. Okay, now we're going to jump right into the main topic. I'm going to list all the reasons that you came up with that Megan may not have wanted to give up the flowers. We're going to look at her body language. We're going to find out what she said to the aide, and we're going to put it all together to try to figure out what her intentions may have been. But before we do, do me a huge favor, 
hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis. All right, so for those of you who haven't seen it, let's take a quick look at the scene. Once again, this is uh, Harry and Megan are interacting with the audience and one of the aides comes over to Megan to ask to take the flowers from her and it seems like she refuses and she holds on to them. Here's the scene, take a look. The side of the park to where William and Kate, Prince William and Kate are, where they are greeting members of the public. They are taking a bunch of the flowers. Interestingly, I think one of the security guards just asked Megan if she wanted him to take the flowers away. Okay, so if that was your first time seeing it, take a second to try to think about why she would have done that, why she would have said no. And if this is your second time seeing it or you've seen it multiple times, just once again, try to remember what your position was on this or maybe you just saw something for the first time now and you're shifting, but try to lock in a reason why you think that is. Look at the body language, look at her energy towards the audience, towards the aid. What is happening? Why do you think she wants to hold on to those flowers? In fact, what I would really love to hear from you is a before and after comment. So right now, remember or note for yourself what you're thinking it is. And after we do the analysis and we look at some of the body language, I would love to know what changed. Did you see something that made you go, oh yeah, you know what? I didn't quite consider that. And did it change your position on this? Uh, or are you just sticking by your guns and saying, no, I have a feeling I had it right at first. So just kind of remember your position now, because at the end, I would love to get a before and after comment from you. But right now, let's talk about all the reasons that have come up. So in the video, me and my guest gave five reasons that we thought Megan wanted to hold on to the flowers, but then we asked you to contribute in the comments. A lot of you agreed with us. There was a lot of people who picked some of the answers we gave, but some of you gave new theories, and some of those theories came up quite often. So the list went from five to 12 reasons that came up quite often of why Megan wanted to hold on to the flowers. So let's start by really quickly going through that list. That way you can all kind of consider all these and try to see which way you're leaning. Let me move over a little here so we can make room for the list over here. And I'm gonna to try to not comment on these right now. So they're all just there and you can all consider them. And after we look at the behaviors, we'll come right back and I'll give you my opinion on each one of these and we'll try to see if we could narrow it down to just a few. So the first one was pacifying. So pacifying in body language is anything we do to soothe ourselves, to comfort ourselves. And sometimes this is done with an object. You might see someone play with their jewelry or, or have something that they're fidgeting with, like a pen, and this is meant to calm us down. So the first reason was pacifier. The second reason was image management. So Megan is aware that the cameras are on. She knows that this footage is gonna go all over social media, all over the news, people are gonna talk. And if she has flowers in her hand, it sends a subconscious signal that, look, people like me. So with flowers in her hand, it softens her image. That's why she wants to hold on to these flowers. That was my second theory. The third reason was perceived humility. So by saying no to the aid, like, no, I'm good, I'll, I'll carry this. It makes her seem more humble. It makes her seem more like a people's person. And this is, again, a softening of an image, but more about being humble. The fourth was actual humility. The same way you might be at a party and a waiter might come to you and say, hey, can I take your glass for you? And you go, no, no, thank you. I'll do it myself because, you know, you are actually humble and you have no problem doing it yourself. You don't inconvenience the person. The fifth reason is one that my guest from last week, David Stevens, suggested, which is that it gives Megan a sense of belonging and purpose. So we could see in a lot of her body language that there's uncertainty, a bit of a lack of confidence. And you know, Megan isn't really sure what her place is within the royal family at all. So this can make her feel like there's a reason I'm here. I'm taking it upon myself to take these flowers myself and set them down there. This gives me a reason. It makes me feel like I belong here. Reason number six was the most popular additional answer in the comments. In fact, I talked about it in a pinned comment and it's the idea that she doesn't want to seem rude to the people who gave her the flowers because if she takes the flowers and immediately hands them off, it seems dismissive, it seems rude. So she wants to take the time to honor what they've given her and say, you know, this is important. I'm going to hold on to this and I will take care of this myself. So it's out of respect for the audience. Number seven, which came up a couple of times in the comment, not as popular as the other ones, but it was definitely there, is that she thinks they're for her. She believes that these flowers are for her, so she's holding on to them because she misunderstood that these people wanted her to put these flowers with the rest of the flowers for the queen. She thought it was for her. Reason number eight. And you know what? I think we'll just deal with reason number eight right now 
because I think it's more of a misunderstanding than an actual answer. But a few commenters said that, well, the reason she's taking the flowers is because the guests can't take the flowers themselves to where they're supposed to go. So she's taking it for them. But I don't think anybody was unclear about that. I think that's pretty clear. And that answers the question as to why she took the flowers, but not why she's holding on to them. I mean, all the aides are there for that purpose. William, Harry, and Catherine are taking the flowers for that purpose. The question isn't why she's taking it, it's why is she holding on to it. So I think we could just get rid of reason number eight because it was more of a misunderstanding of the question rather than the actual answer as to why she's holding on to them. Reason number nine, or as I like to call it, new reason number eight is that she doesn't know the protocol and she's not quite sure why he's there. She wasn't told what the protocol is, so she's just holding on to the flowers because she doesn't get how this is supposed to work. Reason number nine, and this came up a few times, is that uh, it's a sign of rebellion. Like, instead of doing what she's supposed to, she's holding onto the flowers as a way of saying, no, I'm gonna do things my way. I don't care what the protocol is. I don't have to live by these rules. I do things my way. So that was reason number nine. Reason number 10 is that it's important for her to get a photo opportunity. So if she holds onto those flowers and she goes over to where the flowers are and she puts it down, she knows that the media is gonna get a picture of that. And that's something that she thinks will look flattering for her and it'll look good, so she's doing that. Let's take care of that one as well right now because it's not a terrible theory, but it's the same as theory number two, image management. So for the second one I said, her holding the flowers projects a good image in the same way that getting that shot of her putting the flowers down would project a good image. So I don't think it's a, a terrible theory. I just think it's redundant. So let's get rid of that. Finally, the new reason number 10, and this came up quite a bit in the comments, is that the flowers are a blocking mechanism. So in body language, blocking is anything we put between us and the person we're interacting with as a way to create distance. So sometimes we might hold our briefcase in front of us or books or at a bar you might see someone holding their drink in front of them and this is a subconscious way to hide behind an object when we're uncomfortable or to put distance between us and the person we're talking to. So a lot of you thought that this could be a blocking mechanism. All right, so there it is. That is the list of 10 potential reasons that she's holding onto those flowers. We already narrowed it down from 12 to 10 because one of them was very similar to another, so we mushed them together, and another one was more of a misunderstanding, so that's gone, so we're down to 10. Now let's look at the body language, let's look at what she's saying in order to figure out, could we narrow it down even more than that? Let's start by talking about the body language, and there is so much going on with the body language in that short amount of space. The first thing I want you to look at is actually the hands, because something really fascinating happens with the hands. When we start the clip off, the flowers are in her left hand, because she's using her right hand to shake the hands of the audience and interact with them. Now watch what happens when the aide comes over to her. She turns around, and the easiest way to point to where she's trying to point would be to point with her right hand, keeping the flowers in her left. But that's not what she does. She transfers them to her right hand and indicates with her left hand where she intends on going with them. And then when he leaves, she transfers it back to her left hand. So the flowers actually go over to the hand away from him as her left hand comes up and blocks him with the left hand. As the flowers are now here, she's using that left hand to block him to say over there, she's indicating over there. Then as he leaves, she goes back to the left hand to shake their hands. So that's important. It's not just, no thanks, I'm going this way, it's no, you are not getting to these flowers. That's what's happening subconsciously because she's moving it away from him and blocking with the hand closer to him. That right away to me signals intent. It's not just I'm contemplating, I'm thinking about it, what's going on, it's no, these flowers are staying with me and you know, I'm going this way and it, it, this doesn't speak in any way, by the way, to how polite or how rude she's being, just simply that there's definitely intent there that the flowers are staying with me I'm going this way, and there's, she's creating distance between the flowers and the aid. Secondly, I want you to pay attention to how long it takes her to respond to him after she realizes that he's there. So we're not seeing her turn around and listen to him and then answer. She turns around with an answer immediately. So she knows exactly why he's there, and she has a prepared answer, and she has the intention, we see in her body language, to hold on to these flowers and she's ready for that. Okay, third, and this is a big one. This is being discussed all over the internet by people who read body language books and watch body language videos, and they've learned the term and they're slapping it down here. And yes, the term that's being used is correct, but 
the use of it is being misunderstood. So a lot of people are looking at it going, notice, look at her smile, it's not a Duchenne smile, it's not a Duchenne smile. If, if it was real, it would be a Duchenne smile. So what is a Duchenne smile? So the Duchenne smile is named after Guillaume Duchenne, who is the researcher who discovered the muscles that go into a genuine smile. And what he discovered is there's a difference between a genuine smile or not. And with a genuine smile, the corners of the mouth go upwards and the cheeks raise and they cause something called crow's feet, which is small wrinkles on the sides of the eyes. So when we're smiling out of actual joy or happiness, this is the kind of smile we see. It's a big smile, corners go up, cheeks are raised, and there's wrinkling on the side of the eyes. This is called a Duchenne smile. So in this clip, if we look at Megan, technically the commenters are right. It's not a Duchenne smile because we see the corners of the mouth are going more to the sides and we're not seeing the cheeks raise and we're not seeing the crow's feet on the eyes. There is a pleasant look on her face, but it's not a Duchenne smile. But here is where the massive misconception comes in that spreads like a wildfire on the internet. The opposite of a Duchenne smile isn't necessarily a fake smile. It can just as easily be a polite smile. Context is everything. Let me explain what I mean. I have a really close friend who was dating a girl at some point and whenever he would say something positive, whether it was a joke or something positive that happened to him or he had a good day, she would smile but it wasn't a Duchenne smile. The corners of the mouth would go sideways and we wouldn't see the crow's feet, we wouldn't see that actual happiness. And to me I looked at that and figured something is wrong because when we're with a partner and they have good news and they're happy, it's supposed to actually make us happy. As it turns out, she was a horrible person and she was being awfully deceptive, but the point is this. In that context, the lack of a Duchenne smile indicates something. In this case, it doesn't. Because we all use polite smiles in day-to-day -day interactions. When the barista at Starbucks gives us our drink, when our Uber driver drops us off, somebody holds open an elevator, a polite smile doesn't have to indicate immense amounts of joy. So in this case, when she's politely smiling to the aide, I don't see a real smile, nor would I expect to see a real smile. This isn't a big happy occasion that's causing her joy. It remains a sad event. There's a lot of stress. She's trying to figure things out. So it's perfectly normal for her to give a polite smile as she refuses and explains to him why she would rather hold on to the flowers. So is it true that that's not a Duchenne smile? Yes. Does it mean that she's being rude in any way? No, not based on that smile because that's the exact kind of smile that we will almost always see in those situations and we all do it in our day-to-day -day lives. Moving on from that and further down the path of polite gestures, after the refusal, we see a curtsy bow. She literally does the way, you know, women bow like this by bending at the knees. She literally does that right at the end as she minimizes herself. And when we minimize ourselves, it's an act of humility. Like, thank you so much. And we might, thank you, you're very kind. Notice how when you say thank you to someone, your hands might come in as you go, thank you. And her hands do come together and she has that curtsy bow as she looks at him. So this once again is a gesture of courtesy. So we have the polite smile and the polite bow. I want to throw in a little side note here that I find myself saying in a lot of my videos, but I think it's really important. And it's the fact that some people might listen to what I'm saying here and go, thank you, finally, she is so sweet and look at her being all polite and courteous and she's such a sweetie, people ought to leave her alone. And then others might look at this and go, no, it's a fake smile, it's a fake act, she's putting it all on, she just wants to convince people she's a sweetheart, but she's literally the worst and you know, you're just making excuses for her. When in reality, I'm not doing either of those things. I'm not interested in attacking Megan. I'm not interested in defending Megan. I'm only interested in using my experience to point out the body language and the behavior patterns. That's it. We learned very early on in behavioral analysis that we have to remain objective because if I decide that I dislike Megan, I'm going to look at all her behaviors through those lens and only look for behaviors that support that conclusion. And if I like her, I'll do the same, but in that direction. And it's certainly not my intention to argue or debate anyone's position on this. You can like Megan for whatever reason. You've seen things about her that you like. You can dislike Megan for whatever reason because you've seen her do things that you really find questionable. My only job is to use my experience to look at what I'm seeing here with the body language, the facial expressions, and the word choice, and to tell you what we're seeing from a behavioral standpoint and what it might indicate about how she's feeling or what she's thinking. That's it. Okay, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Now moving on, uh, as soon as the aide walks away, we see a grooming gesture. So she uses her right hand to 
move her hair out of the way, and then we see her hand go to Harry's back, and it stays there for quite a while. So both of these are an indication of stress. So grooming is stress when we want to make sure we present ourselves well, we want to fix our hair, fix our tie, fix our watch, adjust our cuffs, our blazer, and hand through the hair is very common. So we have that grooming gesture, and then the hand on the back of Harry and touch is a very comforting thing, especially when it's not a small subtle touch, it's a full palm touch on his back. So she's looking for comfort at this point. So what does this indicate? To me it indicates that there's a bit of stress around this. I think it's very possible that after that interaction in her head she's going, oh here we go again, the media is probably going to have a ball with that. Uh, I wonder what they're going to say, should I have handled that differently? And I think she's thinking about her self-image. You know, grooming is very much associated to self-image. And then she's just kind of in silence going there and standing next to Harry with her hand on his back. So I think she's thinking to herself like, oh, did I handle that right? Maybe I should have done that differently. I wonder how that's going to look for me publicly. Now very soon we're going to talk about what she said, the words that she said. But uh, spoiler alert, right at the end she says, appreciate that. And right as she's saying appreciate that, as he's walking away, we see the eyebrows go up. There's a very distinct eyebrow flash right there, right at the end of the sentence. Now we talk about eyebrow flash a lot on the channel and in most social situations they indicate one of three things. The first one is surprise. When we're surprised, eyebrows go up. Two is positive experience because when things are happy, we jump for joy. Things go upwards when we're happy and eyebrows are an exception. We go, oh my god, this is so great. So eyebrows might go up in that scenario. And third is social acceptance, when we're looking to connect with someone. And I think that's the exact reason the eyebrows go up right there at the end as she's saying thank you so much. And we see this a lot with um, thank you, I appreciate that, when we're trying to connect and we're showing, when, when the eyebrows go up, it's the equivalent of the hands going up like this. It's like you're showing good intention, I have nothing to hide. And it, it's often done when we're looking to connect. So I think that's what it is right at the end. She's showing good intention, eyebrows go up, thank you, I appreciate it. Just. A moment of connection. With all these behaviors, what is the conclusion? Is Megan a kind person? Is Megan a mean person? Does not apply. Non-applicable. This does not prove or deny either of those things. And I've seen quite a few articles out there saying, oh there goes Megan again being a bully with one of the aides. Uh, and I think that's a really unfair assessment. I think anybody who looks at this and sees that she's being a bully has put on some I hate Megan goggles. Now you can dislike Megan. There's nothing wrong with that. You may have heard her say things or seen her do things that didn't sit well with you and you decided that you're just not a fan and that's totally fine. And of course she said things and done things that weren't the best look for her, but this isn't one of those moments. Yes, you can argue that it was a little quick, like she you know, kind of turned, said something really quick, almost dismissive and turned back, like she didn't give him all the time and attention in the world, but that's about it. That's about the extent of it. Besides that, the body language here is almost exactly what I would expect in anyone who's explaining to someone, no, I, I think I'll actually just do this, but thank you, and turning back to resume their conversation. It's what we would see. Okay, now we have the body language, so we're getting a little bit of insight as to how she's feeling, what she's thinking, but now we're going to add the verbal analysis. What is she saying to the gentleman? And there are so many theories online, uh, so many people uh, raised the audio. And even in those, they're disagreeing on what she said because even with the best ones, it's really, really not clear. And there's disagreements on that. And then I even heard some people say that some of the raised audios are, are doctored and edited to make it seem like she's saying one thing. And it's, it's quite unclear. But I actually have brought in someone who can very much help us understand what Megan is saying in that moment. So my guest today is my very good friend Sabrina. Now Sabrina lost her hearing when she was 18 years old and since then has become a degree holding American Sign Language teacher. But the reason she's here is because Sabrina is the best lip reader I've ever met in my life. So I'm really excited to have her on the channel today. This is Sabrina as well as her friend Alexis who is here to interpret for her. Welcome both of you to the channel. I'm so excited to have you here. Now for those of you watching from home, I want you to imagine what it might be like if this video was on mute. If you could not right now hear what I was saying, how much of it would you understand? Believe me, it's really, really difficult. I would not be able to do it. But that is exactly what Sabrina is doing right now. The only way she can understand what I'm saying is that she's reading my lips. Isn't that right, Sabrina? That's right. 
As amazing as that is, Alexis, I'm going to ask you to jump uh, in here and, and help us out. And I want to start by asking you, Sabrina, what was your journey to learn lip reading? Because you're so incredible at it to the point where at times I'm like, how could she have known that? Like I barely move my lips, I mutter something and you'll know. Is this something you study? Is there, is there courses for this or is it just trial and error and practice? Yeah, there's no college degree for lip reading, but it is a lot of practice. When I was younger, around like four or five, my dad, the two of us would lip read each other with my brother. It was really nice because my mom would be strict about bedtime at eight, but my dad would be like, we can watch TV until like nine, 10. And we would do it with voices off. So that was nice. It was a lot of practice and it was practice with my family. And then it became my friends and then it became the community. Yeah, so my specific type of hearing loss is progressive, and it's been in my family for a while. So there are others who know that you will eventually lose your hearing. And so it's a possibility. So we have done that for a while. And it's just kind of a fun game to, to like, before you actually need to use it, it's kind of fun. Now, I do want to say this for the viewers, because it's really important just to have all the information. Sabrina, you do speak, you can speak, but for this interview, you voiced your preference to have Alexis here with us and to use ASL for your answers. Yeah, it's awkward for me to go through my hearing loss and then not be able to hear my voice. So I can no longer hear it and that makes me uncomfortable. So I prefer to turn my voice off and just sign. And I really appreciate you allowing that to happen for this interview. Of course, it's an absolute pleasure to have both of you here. And as much as I understand what you're saying, I think you have a wonderful voice. But either way, I'm, I'm so glad that we're doing this in a way that you can both communicate this to us. So Sabrina, you have seen the clip that I sent you that we're looking at today of Meghan Markle communicating with the aide. And one of the first things that you said to me was that this is challenging. It presents certain challenges. Can you tell us why this clip is particularly challenging? Yeah, so that specific clip is not like, it's the clip is moving, it's like the recording is moving, and then it's kind of blurry. It's not like super specific on the mouth. You can't really see how the mouth is moving. And then Megan herself is also turning her head, so you can't like fully lip read someone if you're looking from the side. That actually makes perfect sense. And that's a little bit on me because again, I've been so impressed by your ability to do this in difficult situations that I had in my head that you're like a superhero who has the ability to know what anyone's saying even miles away in foggy weather. But that's, that's entirely on me. Um, so here it is, Sabrina, the big question, the moment we've all been waiting for, and I'm really impatient to hear this as well. To the best of your knowledge, what is Megan saying to the aide as she turns to face him? So that first sentence is really easy. She's saying, I already told them that I will take the flowers over there. Then that second sentence is a little bit more difficult. And so, it, because it's a little bit blurry, so I think that she's saying that I, I will do that, I should do that. And that third sentence is again, a little bit easier. She's saying, I appreciate that, thank you. That is awesome. And it's very much in line with if we look at the audio clip that's been augmented, even if the whole thing isn't clear, there's a couple of things that are clear and I'm pretty sure we hear told and place. So that's very much in line with what you said. And at the end, we do hear thank you and appreciate. So that lines up quite nicely. Alexis, my next question is actually for you. When you translate from American Sign Language to English, are you translating word for word literally what Sabrina has said or is it more of like a gist, a general meaning of what she said? So yeah, it's definitely more of the general concept that Sabrina is sharing. So sometimes if she was trying to be very specific and using like specific words, I will share that if it's something like really important for her to be sharing that she wants me to say. But most of the time in ASL, as I assume with most languages, I am like communicating the general concept that she is sharing with me.
with what you've said, and I'm piecing together here with some of the audio that I think I heard, uh, I'm going to say the sentence that I think is a mix of what you've just said here and what I think I heard in that audio. And Sabrina, tell me if there's a good likelihood that this is what she said. These were the words. I told them I'd place them over there, so I'll do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Would you say that that is quite close to what she may have said? Oh, yeah, I agree. I want to thank both of you so much for being here today and Sabrina for sharing your amazing talent with us and helping us figure out a little bit more what the message is here because there's a lot of myths online, people saying, oh, she's for sure saying this, for sure saying that, but now we have someone who does this every day who helped us figure out what the general idea was of what she was saying there. So Sabrina, Alexis and I had a quick lesson before you joined this chat, so I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for being here with us today and to both of you. <laughs> so with a margin of error, the statement we're getting is, I told them I'd place them over there, so I'll do that. Thank you, I appreciate that. So whether the details in the middle are, are that or not, it seems pretty clear that there's an I told them. So there's a priority. She's starting the sentence with I told them. It's not, I'm gonna do this. I would rather put these down, I'm going to do this. The focus isn't on her decision, what she wants is, I told them. It's honoring what I told them. So from a verbal standpoint, that's pretty important. It, it's telling us our priority as to why she's doing this, and it's about them. And I think that's going to help us with our list quite a little bit. Okay, so now let's go right back to the list, and we're going to look at each one of these one at a time, and see if, given what we've seen with the language, what we've seen with the body language, are all of these still very likely, or can we narrow it down to a few that appear to be a little bit more likely? And I love that we get to do this because this is really the process of analysis. We, we have all these theories, and the body language, the facial expressions, and the word choice helps us narrow it down. And you know, very often you do that, and you come down to just really just one or maybe two things, and sometimes you do it and there's still a lot of possibilities left. So let's see what happens to our list with this information. So number one, pacifier. Are, are the flowers uh, a pacifier? So a lot of you agreed that that could be part of it, but in most cases when, when, when in the comments you pick that, you combine it with something else. A lot of you said, I think it's a mix of this and this. Very few people said it was just a pacifier, and I think I agree with that because when she turns back, we don't see her using the flowers as a pacifier. They dangle by her side as she continues to interact and she pacifies with her other hand. Holds on to Harry, so Although she is in need for comfort, it doesn't seem like the flowers are 100% providing that. Maybe a little bit, maybe it kind of helps, but I don't think it's the main reason. And so I'm ready to strike that from our list as being a main reason, a main motivation to hold on to them. Number two, image management. Uh, I still think that's a really strong contender. For her to say, no, no, I told them that I'm gonna go place them over there. So it's very possible there's a part of her going, yeah, you know, I want people to see me doing this for them. It's going to be good for my image. The camera might catch that. So I think number two is still very much a strong contender. The third and fourth, uh, perceived humility or actual humility. This might surprise you uh, because I know that a lot of people like that answer, but I am going to strike both. And let me tell you why. We've established with her body language that her focus is not on the aid. She turns around and yes, it's polite, but quickly just says what she has to him and turns right back to the audience. If she was trying to appear humble or if there was actual humility behind this motivation, she would give him a little bit more attention and time than that, I believe. She would turn around, hear him out, interact with him a little more. Thank you, you're so kind. By the way, thanks for doing this. If I was really trying to push humility, that's what we would see. So I don't think this is motivated by humility simply because humility would be focused on the aid her attention seems to be a lot more focused with the audience. Remember, the first thing she said is, I told them. This is about them. This isn't about you and me, it's about them. So I'm going to strike perceived humility or actual humility. Theory number five, David's uh, theory of belonging and purpose. For her to say, no, I'm going I'm to hold on to these, I'm going to do this for them because I told them I was going to do this. I absolutely believe it. I, I love that theory because again, she's saying, I told them I'm going to do this. This is important. This is my purpose. I'm doing this for them. This is why I'm here. 
and she feels like this gives her a reason to be there. So I absolutely think that that one still belongs on the list. I would also like to add that although right after the interaction with the aide, there was a small dip in confidence because we see that grooming, we see her getting close to the Harry, she puts her hand on him, she's a little less interactive with the crowd, but just a little bit after that, for the first time since they got there, she's separate from Harry. In fact, she's on the other side of the walkway, she's communicating with the crowd, she's by herself, and she no longer seems to need him there for comfort and reassurance. And to me, that's a huge point for reason number five because it seems like now that she's interacting with them and they're giving her these flowers and she feels like there's a certain purpose, a certain sense of belonging, we could see that she could separate from Harry now because it's almost like she feels like there's a reason for her to be here. So number five is looking really, really good for me. Next, number six, which was submitted by a lot of viewers, uh, the, the courtesy towards the audience, I love it. I think it flies almost to the top of the list because absolutely, She's focused on the audience, turns away, blocks with her hand. Nope, these flowers are staying here. And, and it's not just that the hand blocks the aid. It also approaches the flowers to the audience. My focus is with them. I'm doing this for them. They want this to go there. A lot of focus. I, she starts her sentence with, I told them. This is about them. So yes, courtesy towards the audience, being given something and saying, I, you know, I will treat this with respect, with care, for her to take it and show the audience some respect and hold on to it as opposed to immediately getting rid of it. Love that theory, top of the list. The next one is that she thinks they're for her. And here's what's crazy about this one. Some people in the comments thought that not only does she not realize that the flowers aren't for her, but that my guest last week, David and I don't realize that the flowers aren't for her, that those flowers are for the queen and that we're talking about this like they're for her. But of course we realize that. In fact, David's entire theory that this gives her a sense of belonging, like she has a purpose here to take these flowers and go put them herself, very clearly indicates that he understood that these are for the queen. I legitimately don't think that anybody watching this or Megan herself could reasonably believe that the flowers are for her. And let me tell you why I think that. Um, her appearance was a very last minute decision. These people are at the front of the line, which means they probably got there very early that morning in order to have the best row in the house. It's extremely likely that when they decided to show up that morning and went and got the flowers, they didn't even know Meghan Markle was gonna be there, much less that she'll be walking right in front of them. So the odds of her bringing flowers in hopes that they'll be able to give it to Meghan doesn't make any sense. I don't think she thought that. I don't think it needs clarity that those flowers really were not for her. They were for the queen like every other flower. So personally, you can keep it on your list. But personally, I'm removing they think they're for her, that the flowers are for Megan off the list. Next one down the list is that she doesn't know the protocol and she wasn't sure who he is or why he's there and what's going on. And I think that the answer to whether that's likely or not is in the body language because if she didn't know the protocol and who he is and what's going on, we would see a much slower interaction. It takes time to figure things out. She would turn around, she would look at him, she would hear him out. We would see a bit of confusion on her face, reflection, thinking about it, a realization like, oh, that's what we're doing with these. That's not what we're seeing. She turns on immediately and answers his request and moves the flowers away and says, no, no, I told them I was gonna put them over there. She immediately has an answer for him. The body language would suggest that she's very clear on what the protocol is. She's very clear on what the aides are doing there. She's very clear on who these flowers are for and where they're going. And she immediately turns around to address what he wants. So for me, that's coming off the list. I don't believe that she didn't know what was happening and why he was there. Also, this is a big event. In the car, it's very likely that there was someone there, an employee or Harry himself, who would explain to her the protocol and what's happening here. They're not gonna throw her into this situation completely cluelessly. So for me, I do not believe that it was a lack of understanding the protocol. Now there is a big important side note for that potential reason. And it's the fact that I don't know, and I don't think anybody can reasonably assume just how much she was briefed and how much she knew. Because a lot of you commented, and we even talked about it in the last video, there were moments where she wasn't sure what she was supposed to be doing. She was looking over to the other three, potentially for cues to figure out what's going on. So there were moments where she wasn't entirely certain. To add to that, there are more than one reasons that the aides have to take the flowers from the royals. One of them is security. They have to make sure there's nothing dangerous in there. So if she knew that and didn't give the flowers to the aide, that is neglectful behavior. 
But once again, I don't know, and I don't think anybody who wasn't there can know how much she was debriefed. The only thing I'm saying is in her behavior, in the way that she turned around and immediately knew to tell him, no, no, no I, I told him that I would put this here, so I'm gonna do that, but thank you. In the way that she was immediately prepared and didn't seem confused or wasn't like looking at her like what's going on or shocked or didn't wait for him to explain, she knew exactly what he wanted. And based on that behavior, all I'm saying is, I believe that she understood the protocol of giving the flowers to the aides. More than that, I'm not sure how much she knew, what she didn't know. And if for these reasons you wanna say, no, I think she may have been confused about the protocol, I completely respect that. But again, based on her behavior, for me, I don't think that that's the reason she held onto the flowers. And another reason I don't think it's a lack of knowledge for the protocol is that it wouldn't make sense for a response to be refusal if she didn't understand the protocol. The logical response would be to turn around to see what he wants and he would explain to her, oh, I'm, I'm one of the aides, I'm here to take these flowers for such and such reasons. And she would go, oh, okay, didn't know that, here it is. It doesn't make sense for her lack of understanding to result in a refusal to give him the flowers. To me, it doesn't equate, plus there's the behavior. So for me, that's not one of the top likely reasons. Okay, next up we have the rebellion theory, which is this is a way for Megan to say, no, I don't abide by your rules, I do things my way, and it's just an act of rebellion. And a lot of people have argued that the way she's behaving with Harry is in itself an act of rebellion because we could see that William and Catherine are being professional, keeping their distance, they're here as the royals, they're here to represent something, and it's not the time for that PDA behavior. And I do think there's some validity to that. I do believe that it would look a little more professional, a little more proper if they were keeping their distance. Uh, but you know, in moments of grief, Harry's probably going through something very emotional here. Uh, he might have needed that. So I can argue that either way. But the flowers as an act of rebellion, I'm really not sure I could get on board with that because it would be a giant disrespect, not only to the country, the world, but her husband. And she's there showing him support, showing him love. It would be inconsistent of her to go from, I'm here for you, I'm supporting you, to no, I'm doing this my way. It wouldn't be consistent. And I feel like this is one of those occasions where people who are looking for reasons to point fingers at Megan and how awful she is um, are, are really trying to fit this into that narrative. I'm not personally seeing a giant act of rebellion here with these flowers. And that leaves us with the final one, which is blocking the audience. So uh, used as a barrier or to block. And I'm also going to personally for myself, not consider that one as one of my top contenders because immediately after he leaves, we see other signs of her stress. We see the grooming, we see her hand on his back, but the flowers are by her side. She doesn't bring them up to the block. She doesn't bring them up as a barrier. For the rest of that interaction, they're by her side. And if there was a time to block or bury or feel that you need to hide behind a security blanket, it would have been that moment. So I personally don't think, I think it's a good thought, I think it's a good theory. And again, kind of like the pacifier, it might be part of the reason it's there, but I'm not seeing it as the main reason. I'm not seeing it as Megan saying, I absolutely need these flowers as a barrier between me and the audience, because quite simply in the body language, we're not seeing it that way. She continues to shake hands and she's not using it like that. So at the end of the day, what are for me the top three contenders as to why she held onto the flowers? Well, first we have the idea of image management. Like with these flowers, it looks good for the cameras. It shows people that I'm loved. I might go put the flowers down. That's a great photo opportunity. A lot of you said that. I subscribe to that. I think that could very well be part of the reason. Second, the sense of belonging and purpose for herself. I wasn't sure if I have a place here, but oh look, they're asking, they're giving me this important thing to do with these flowers. I will do that. I have a reason for being here. So those two are very connected. It's basically for herself and for the world, I have a place here. And finally, as a respect to the audience member who gave it to her to say, uh, yes, I'm holding on to this. I'm not just gonna discard it. I will take care of this for you. So to show respect to the audience, I think for me, based on the behavior, based on what she's saying, based on what we're seeing, those are the three most likely reasons. But like I said earlier, I want to hear from you. I want your before and after comments. So pause the video and then come back to it because I have one more important thing to say. But pause the video, head down to the comments and let me know what was your before thought and your after thought and more importantly, did it change? Did you have an opinion? And then you saw these behaviors, what she's saying, what she's doing, and it just made you go, yeah, that's just gonna lock in my impression even more. 
Or is it, oh, you know, I hadn't seen that. I think I'm going to change my answer a little bit more towards this. It doesn't have to be the same conclusions I have. You might have a different experience and go, actually, I wouldn't have crossed that other one off the list because I still feel it's that. I would love to hear from you what happened to your thinking process. And if you enjoyed this walking through with me of this process of elimination based on behavior, and if you would like to see more things like this, let me know in the comments and come back. One last thing before we go, really important. Uh, we had a contest last week where uh, we were offering two free spots to David Stevens' workshop about confidence and how to use body language to appear more confident and work on the image that you project. And the winners were announced. I reached out to them and we've given away those two spots, but the discount code is still valid. You can get 20% off. The link is in the description of this video. It's gonna be an amazing workshop. David is one of the best in the world at what he does. I, by the way, don't have a stake in this. I don't get a cut or anything for people to use my discount code. I want everyone to learn from David. So use the discount code, check out the workshop. It's gonna be awesome. Hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you on the next one.